Thank you for having me today and allowing me to speak in a little detail about the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland's archives and collections, and in particular, on our focus and specialism in brass. My name is Stuart Harris Logan, and I'm the Keeper of Archives and Collections at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Having joined the company in 2009 initially in the library, it was my happy job to actually create the archive. We formally opened our search room doors two years later, so this year we're celebrating 10 years. Today, I propose to spend a little bit of time speaking about each of our brass archives in turn. Each are quite different and so deserve to be spoken about individually, as of course are their various functions in supporting the research and performance communities at RCS. At the time of opening, we already had one brass focused special collection, which lived temporarily in a closed rolling stack in the library, the Robert Minter archive. This material is every bit as interesting for its backstory as its contents. Robert Minter was born in Columbia, USA in 1949, although he was educated in the UK, including in Scotland. In terms of music, however, he was largely self-taught, and that is, as is common in autodidacts, his interest in the subject quickly blossomed into a passion. His other great passion was for flying. His application to join the RAF being refused, he took a bank loan and bought flying lessons. He then found an ingenious way to indulge his two loves and combine them, spending the rest of his life flying his own plane around the world, charming his way into private collections, museums and archives, and even a few monasteries, and taking copies of all the music that interested him. When he was allowed, unbelievably, he took facsimiles of the material. When the material's owners and curators had a little more conservational nous, he was forced into making handwritten transcriptions. I have to tell you, these are incredibly neat and precise. You could perform, perform from them. Facsimile material poses a lot of problems for conservators in my field, because in this case, they were created using the old heat transfer technology, and many have faded. Light badly affects them, and the information contained on them begins to lift. Here you can see an example, it really is quite poor. On the left-hand side, you see it just as it is. This, the right-hand side, you can see it with some um, augmentation, digital augmentation, to try to bring it further to the surface. The handwritten manuscripts are as bright today as when they were written some 50 years ago and more. The Indian composer A.R. Raman once said that success comes to those who dedicate everything to their passion. And in Robert Minter's case, if success is measured by the volume of material he has ultimately bequeathed to the RCS archives and collections, then we can agree. The Robert Minter archive consists of some 750 pieces of music, largely trumpet repertoire and largely from the 17th to 18th centuries. Incidentally, we awarded A.R. Raman an honorary doctorate in 2014, but that's not relevant to today. Trevor Herbert, who created the hand list to the archive, has characterised it as significant. And most importantly, in terms of provenance, he's managed in many cases to provide the sources of the music, something which Minter didn't necessarily take note of at the time. Here we can see the very start of Trevor Herbert's hand list. Intriguingly, some pieces remain untraced and unattributed, which poses a dilemma for researchers, which promises to be a rich theme. If we think of A.R. Raman's quote again, I'm sorry to say that Minter did dedicate everything to his passions, and it was actually while piloting a small light aircraft in Scotland that Minter died. On the 17th of November 18, 1981, during a flight from Inverness to Glasgow, he encountered freak weather conditions which caused his plane to crash into Ben Lady, a Corbett mountain, that's one below Monroe, in Stirlingshire. The bequest came to us via Trevor Herbert and the Open University. The earliest piece in the collection is Monteverdi's Toccata for Six Trumpets from his opera Orfeo, which dates to 1607. And that's significant because it's one of the earliest, if not the earliest piece of trumpet music ever printed. Before that, it seems likely that trumpet playing was either extempore or learned by oral transmission from master to pupil. And actually in the Minter archive, there are several examples of sonatas for two trumpets where the lead trumpeter, the master, is clearly delineated against the subordinate, their apprentice, who would follow. Of course, 
at this period, we're talking about repertoire for natural trumpets and not the modern variety. I believe my colleague Arnold Myers will be showing an example of a natural trumpet from our instrument collections just following this. The Minter Archive is a goldmine of early trumpet music, and it does get played. In fact, in 2003, our then principal, John Wallace, accompanied a group of our students to the Scottish Parliament where they performed Johann Hertel's Concerto a Sank from the Minter Archive in front of the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and a group of Scottish Archives delegates. The piece itself dates to the mid 18th century and comes from the French Royal Court's tradition of promenading picnics where the players would be suitably disguised behind bushes and up trees so as not to frighten the aristocrats who were otherwise enjoying their entertainment. It's a bright piece, quite lively and repetitive, as was the style. I'd be surprised if it's been heard much before or after that one performance in 2013. It underscores, if that's not too tasteless a pun, the importance of preserving these things in the way that Minter has enabled us to do. Moving on from Minter, since the inception of the Royal Conservatory of Scotland's archives and collections, we have continued to grow in number and the diversity of our holdings, but we retain a very strong presence in the world of brass. Another very significant collection was acquired by us the year after the Scottish Parliament reception. The original research, personal ephemera and performance archive of Ed Tarr. Edward Hankins Tarr was another American born in Norwich, Connecticut in 1936. His Wikipedia page describes him as a pioneer in the revival of Baroque and Romantic era trumpet performance practice, which is no understatement. I first met Ed in September 2013 and I was immediately impressed by his encyclopedic breadth of knowledge on his subject. It was only later when I was collating his archival material that I grew to be in awe of his performance career as well. The TAR archive, as you can see on the screen there, is one of the largest in our care. Physically, it takes up over 12 linear meters of shelving, but even so, it represents only a fraction of the material he had in his study. Clearly, we had to be selective. The TAR archive is divided into 14 discrete sections covering various aspects of his scholarly and performance outputs. We begin with his biographical research into individual trumpeters, and I will just focus on, on one example for the purposes of today, the trumpeter of Sekingen. Believed to have been a real historical figure in 17th century Germany, the trumpeter is named Franz Werner Kirchhofer, and he was a resident of Bad Sechingen, a town on the River Rhine and on the edge of the Black Forest. Like many tales that have passed into common folklore, we're dealing with a rather saccharine love story between a trumpeter and a local aristocrat's daughter, and through a convoluted series of events, finally proves his worth to her family and he gets to marry her. Well, the story endures in the local area and the town itself is well known among those interested in trumpet history. Bad Sechingen calls itself the town of the trumpeter, and there are memorials throughout the town to attest to it. An opera and a book have been written on the subject, and Bad Sechingen's long association with the trumpet was behind its choice of location for an important trumpet museum in the town's castle. I mention this because Ed Tarr was its founding director, so it seems quite appropriate that the Tarr archive contains the most comprehensive bibliography and original research on the story of and our infamous trumpeter, something which may very well be the envy of the museum itself. I'm ashamed to say I still haven't had a chance to visit it. Ed's primary research on individual trumpeters took up 14 fat ring binders in his study, although needless to say, they've all been moved to a more conservation friendly storage medium. Adding it all up, we have primary research on more than 200 trumpeters in his archive. Another important area of Ed's interest was historical brass pedagogy, which we touched on a little earlier in the Minter archive. Ed actually held one of the largest private collections of early trumpet method books, including some of the more unusual tutor books from Russia. Here we see the Kasner military book with also a, a leaf from inside the eagle-eyed amongst you will spot a uh, buccine trombone at the bottom in the middle. We actually have one of those in the archive but it's not from Ed Tarr's collection. Trumpet method books 
sort of early teacher self books seem to have become more of a thing in the early to mid 19th century when an increase in general literacy saw a concomitant rise in musical literacy among the general population. They're an encapsulation of what was being taught when and where, and given the right, wide range of method books, Tar collected, they invite scholarly comparison. That's an open invitation to all the delegates joining us today. By far the largest portion of the Tar archive, however, is taken up by his Urtext editions of trumpet music, nearly 200 of them. Ed Tar's authority on the trumpet was immense, and that is reflected in his many well-researched scholarly editions of trumpet music. Working with around a dozen different publishers, he began this project from the late 1960s and continued to produce editions for the next 50 years. They remain the authoritative editions to this day. In particular, he's remembered for his entire suite of Torelli editions, and perhaps most importantly, Verdi's Adagio for trumpet and orchestra, which he actually discovered. The Adagio was composed early in Verdi's career before he became a celebrated opera composer. And the manuscript survived in the house of Verdi's father-in-law, the merchant Antonio Barezzi. Ed told me that it had remained hidden for so long because the manuscript had actually been sewn into the back of a sofa. In the UK, I think we used to use down and wool to pad our sofas, but no, not in Italy. Barezzi actually paid for Verdi's musical training and is often credited as the man who first discovered his talent. Ed came out of retirement to perform the Adagio with his wife, Ermtraut, at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland in May 2015, at a concert to mark the acquisition of the Tar Archive earlier that year. Our collection of Tar editions is important, not just because of the vast breadth of material he produced, but also because we have all of his pre-compositional notes we can see the source material with which he was working and glean some insight into his methodology and process. Given his expertise, Ed would often be invited by universities to be the external examiner on doctoral theses on the trumpet, and he kept a copy of each. Over his long career, he examined over 120 theses. There are actually 125 in the archive, which includes his own, Henry Purcell, completed in 1957. Unfortunately, as we know, Ed died last spring, but his archive continues to be one of the most heavily used resources in the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland's collections. Earlier, I spoke in a little detail about the primary biographical research undertaken by Ed in the course of his career, and this moves us on to another sizable archive in our care, the personal research and correspondence of Friedel Keim. Franz Friedrich Keim, known as Friedel, is a trumpeter and author with now three volumes of his Das große Buch der Trompete in print. An immense who's who of trumpeters, both past and present. His method appears to have been fairly straightforward. With living trumpeters, he would write to them directly and send them a questionnaire covering the salient points of their history and career, which he could then use to write up their entries. In the case of trumpeters who were no longer with us, he conducted his own historical research and his notes and findings from these, as well as copies of correspondence and questionnaire responses from living trumpeters, form the basis of the Keim archive. Keim separated performers out into three broad categories, classical, by far the largest, followed by jazz, and then finally popular. I'm listing them in order of extent and not preference, by the way. The archive is extensive, running to 76 boxes or 10 linear meters of material. That's a lot of letters. What's fascinating about Keim's work is what he was able to unearth, which isn't necessarily popularly known, such as the relationship between Ernst Mordel, the maker of the famous emo trumpet and mutes, and Louis Armstrong. Here we can see a photograph, or a couple of photographs, in fact, of Ernst Model with Louis Armstrong. Ernst Model was born in the late 19th century in what is now Czechia, or the Czech Republic, in a town close to the border with modern Germany. And he seems to have come from a musical pedigree. One of his 18th century ancestors is listed as a musical instrument seller, which is exactly the business Ernst entered into in the early 20th century.
initially making rotary valve blocks before diversifying later into full instrument manufacture. The First World War and the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which controlled the region at the time, meant there was a real stagnation in business. But Ernst Model appears to have persevered, only to be met with the financial crisis in the late 20s with the stock market crash in America and the economic shockwaves that produced throughout the world. Nevertheless, Model appears to have been able to sustain himself throughout until we come to an even more cataclysmic time. In 1938, Model's hometown and the surrounding area was incorporated wholesale into the German Reich. It seems counterintuitive, but at the beginning, business boomed. Each of the Hitler Youth organizations, which were springing up all over the Reich, had an associated brass band, and instruments were required for these at unprecedented pace. During the war, Model was able to continue inventing, and in 1940, he was able to submit a patent to the German Patent Office for a new ball joint connection for rotary valves in wind instruments, which was subsequently granted in 42 and published in 1943. As the war progressed, however, business began to fall away and his factory was finally requisitioned for armament production. Labour was largely carried out by Russian prisoners of war and otherwise as directed by the Reich. So, as you can imagine, nobody was making any money and conditions must have been very poor. Model lost everything. The displacement of huge groups of people after the war turned Ernst Model and his family into refugees. It's around this time he seems to have turned his attention back to instruments, and we find his first designs for trumpet mutes and the emo trumpet begins to really take off worldwide. Louis Armstrong had a habit of changing his instrument every few years, usually giving his old ones away to friends, so he bought a lot during his career. While he started off on Selmer models, when he discovered the emo trumpet, he was hooked. A letter from Armstrong to Model in 1955 stated, the emo trumpet is the finest horn I've ever played in my whole life. And I know that because a facsimile of that letter is among Kaim's research in his archive. I think it's more or less time to be wrapping up now, but I can't finish without telling you that this is just dipping a toe into some of the more extensive brass-related archives of the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. I haven't had time to talk about the NW Jackson Crystal Palace Brass Band Championships archive, an incredible social history of the early brass band movement, or of the fanfare arrangements and compositions by Ernest Bullock, known to his students as Deadly Ernest, for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II and her father, George VI, or even the Ernest Hall Trumpet Method manuscript. But to finish on one last name, about whom I think my colleague Arnold will speak at greater depth, we must mention John Webb. We acquired the Webb collection of historic brass and wind instruments in 2012, but when John died a couple of years later, I took a trip down to Padbrook, his home, with Tony George, and collected appurtenances to the instrument collection, including some of his rudimentary sketch designs for his instruments, and odds and ends from John's workshop, an old lean-to at the back of the house. I won't spend any more time on that other than to whet your appetite for Arnold's exposition on the incredible instrument collection we acquired from him. Thank you.